All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Sydney Hankerson. I'm vice chair for community engagement in the Department of Psychiatry and director of mental health equity research in the Institute for Health Equity Research here at Mount Sinai. Uh, today, I have the, the distinct pleasure uh, to, to introduce uh, just a dear friend and colleague and really an internationally recognized expert uh, in, in studying mental health equity, uh, Dr. Ruth Shim. So I just want to just intro welcome everyone uh, to this Just Talk series. Uh, this series uh, is sponsored by the Psychiatry DEI uh, Committee, which is led uh, by Dolores Malaspina and Shilfa Tafok. So I want to give them a shout out for their amazing leadership with the DEI Committee in Psychiatry. It's also co-sponsored by the Institute for Health Equity Research, which is directed by Dr. Carol Horowitz and Lynn Richardson. Um, this represents the fourth uh, Just Talk series. Um, so we're really excited uh, to introduce our speaker and welcome everyone today. So a little bit about our speaker and then we'll jump right in. So in terms of our formal bio, uh, Dr. Ruth Shim is currently the Luke and Grace Kim Professor in Cultural Psychiatry and Professor of Clinical Psychiatry at the University of uh, California, Davis. She also serves as the Associate Dean of Diverse and Inclusive Education at UC Davis School of Medicine. Her research focuses on mental health disparities and inequities. And she also is a practicing clinician where she provides psychiatric care at the UC Davis Early Diagnosis and Preventative Treatment Clinic. Uh, before she assumed her leadership roles at UC Davis, uh, Dr. Shim was vice chair of psychiatry at Lenox Hill Hospital in New York City. She also has had leadership roles at the Morehouse School of Medicine, as well as at Emory University. Uh, in terms of her national recognition for being really an expert and scholar at addressing mental health equity, uh, she is on the editorial boards for JAMA Psychiatry, for Psychiatric Services, for the Community Mental Health Journal, as well as the American Psychiatric uh, Publishing Company. She has co-edited uh, several books. Uh, one, The Social Determinants of Mental Health uh, with Dr. Michael Compton, and she recently published a book called Social Injustice and Mental Health, which will be the focus of her talk today. Um, just on a personal level, in terms of her training, Dr. Shim uh, went to medical school and did her uh, psychiatry residency at Emory University. We were actually in medical school and residency together, and she modeled what it was like to really be an advocate, to be a leader, and I tell everyone this, that I would not be where I am professionally or personally without her guidance, her support, and her mentorship. Uh, so I am just tremendously happy and excited to uh, hear our talk today. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Shim. Dr. Hankerson, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, it, it's, it's really um, a pleasure to be virtually here with all of you today. And it's actually, I think, very special for a number of reasons. Um, first, because Dr. Hankerson, as he mentioned, and I go way, way back. Um, and it's very hard for me to kind of contemplate that we have known each other for over 20 years now um, that that seems really just hard to to contemplate and 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 it's been it's been great to move through psychiatry together um, with uh, Dr. Hankerson as such a, a close friend and colleague um, and then also it's also nice to be here talking to you all at Mount Sinai because um, it was not that long ago that I lived um, a couple of blocks away um, in New York City uh, from from Mount Sinai and so. Um, it's it's a little bit uh, bittersweet also to um, be so close, but yet still so far away now on the West Coast. Um, so I, it's a pleasure to be here with you. And I have a lot of content that I want to cover in a really, really short amount of time. So I'm going to I'm going to launch in. So today we are going to spend some time um, covering um, a number of challenging learning objectives. We're going to make um, we're going to define a couple of things. 
including social justice, the social determinants of mental health, mental health inequities, and actually many other things as well, because I actually really just love definitions. So we're gonna spend a lot of time on definitions. And then we're also going to consider how um, social justice contributes to mental health inequities. And then we're gonna examine the role of social justice in the field of mental health. Um, but as I always talk about, um, I have to um, mention before we start talking about this topic, a couple of things. And the reason that we have to do this, I have to do disclaimers before we talk about this topic. And I always tell people I don't have anything to disclose, but I have many, many things to disclaim. And so the first of these things is that this is a very difficult and uncomfortable topic. Um, it remains a difficult and uncomfortable topic to talk about issues related to race and racism, to talk about issues about inequity and injustice in our society. Um, and as we start to tackle these issues and get into it, oftentimes a lot of complex feelings will emerge. And many of those feelings include things like guilt, anger, and uh, resentment and defensiveness. Um, and you may perceive me of accusing you of being all sorts of terrible things. And that's another reason why I have to uh, make this disclaimer up front. Um, as those feelings start to arise, you may feel that I have a very specific political agenda that I'm pushing um, or that I lack objectivity. I share these things with you today because these are all things that um, have been given to me as feedback as I've talked about these issues or attempted to talk about these issues. And I just wanna say that um, it's normal to feel all of those things. So if you, if you feel those things, um, I would really encourage us to um, practice some self-reflection because we are all mental health professionals. And I think that if we can't acknowledge that it's difficult to talk about these things, um, it is really an unrealistic expectation that we have that other people would be able to tackle these issues as well. And so in the spirit of that, as we um, progress through this uh, talk today, um, we're gonna have opportunities to practice self-reflection. And so I will give um, several um, self-reflection questions and I would ask that you spend a little bit of time reflecting on those questions to start kind of that practice and that task because it's really the act of self-reflection that can lead to I think progress and thinking about how we address these issues. So um, I'm still in my disclaimer phase. It takes a little while, but I'll get there. Um, so why is it so hard to talk about social injustice? Um, mainly it is because here in the United States, we have been socialized to believe that it is not polite to talk about such things as racism and injustice and oppression. And in addition to that, health professionals have not been taught that there is a very clear and very deeply evidence-based connection between oppression, injustice, and health. And then the other reason why it's just so difficult in our society to talk about social injustice relates to the fact that after the murder of George Floyd, um, we saw an incredible response uh, across the world, but particularly in the United States, um, and, and uh, the protests uh, against racial justice and the awakening um, led many to believe that we were in the state um, of a racial reckoning in our society. Um, and, I, and I say that um, it's important for us to talk about how when we make these movements and this progress on these issues, sometimes that progress is met with a lot of deep retrenchment. So I say it, that there was this racial reckoning, but it really wasn't a racial reckoning because what we see um, with this data from the New York Times is that current times, white people are actually less supportive of Black Lives Matter than they were at the beginning of 2020. So prior to the death, uh, prior to the murder of George Floyd, there were actually more people in general, but in particular white people that supported the Black Lives Matter movement. And currently we see less people supporting the Black Lives Movement than even before um, the murder of George Floyd. So um, it's really challenging to tackle these issues, but it's even more challenging to have a sustained effort and um, an intensive kind of sustained approach to address this. So the last of my disclaimers is that this is really hard. And so whenever I think about kind of trying to tackle a difficult issue, I find that the words of James Baldwin can be really sustaining. And so um, I, I would like us all to kind of keep that as we move through this talk. He said, I'm not interested in anybody's guilt. Guilt is a luxury that I can no longer, that we can no longer afford. I know you didn't do it and I didn't do it either. 
but I am responsible for it because I am a man and a citizen of this country and you are responsible for it for the very same reason. So with that, we can actually start the talk. So we're gonna be talking about social justice and social injustice today. And so I think it's really important for us to think about how we might define uh, social justice. Because again, as I mentioned, many of these topics are um, politically controversial in some ways. Um, and just an example of how these topics are particularly politically controversial. There was an article that was published in 2019 and actually several subsequent follow-up articles uh, all published in the Wall Street Journal, um, all by the same physician, Dr. Stanley Goldfarb, really lamenting um, the decline in the focus in medical education on issues of social justice. Um, and this particular um, article is pretty um, salient. Um, he, he titled it, Take Two Aspirin and Call Me By My Pronouns. And he said, at woke medical schools, curricula are increasingly focused on social justice rather than treating illness. And the main thesis of Dr. Goldberg's Berg, argument here, he says, why have medical schools become a target for inculcating social policy when the stated purpose of medical education since Hippocrates has been to develop individuals who know Know how to cure patients. Curricula will increasingly focus on climate change, social inequities, gun violence, bias, and other progressive causes only tangentially related to treating illness, and so will many of your doctors in coming years. So really he, he, he's just lamenting the idea um, that these issues that he does not feel are central um, to medicine are, are being um, kind of focused in on. Um, in response to that, I think, you know, there are there are um, different ways to approach this idea, but several of his colleagues um, at the University of Pennsylvania um, published a response to this op-ed in the Philadelphia Inquirer, and they said social and health policies have always determined who gets sick and who gets care and where and how. Understanding the social drivers of health and illness is not peripheral or tangential to health. It is the key to diagnosing and meeting a patient's fundamental needs. And so again, there's controversy about social justice. And so when there is controversy about things, I think it's really important to have very clear definitions. And so let's define social justice. Um, it's actually a philosophical um, uh, definition. It's a philosophical term. Um, and so several philosophers have, have defined what social justice actually is. Um, and so the philosopher David Miller said, it is the distribution of good and advantages or bad and disadvantages in society, and more specifically, how these things should be distributed in our society. So it's concerned with the ways that resources are allocated to people by social institutions. And I also want to add to this definition, um, another philosopher, John Rawls, who said that social justice is assuring the protection of equal access to liberties, rights, and opportunities, as well as taking care of the least advantaged members of society. And that part is really critical when we're talking about social justice, because we're thinking about how mental health, health, um, and all of these issues kind of interplay and, and intersect with each other. And oftentimes people with serious mental health problems, people with substance use disorders end up um, by virtue of oppression and marginalization end up becoming the least advantaged members of our society. And so um, it becomes really clear that when we're talking about social justice, that um, thinking about people from marginalized communities, including mental health is really uh, critical to that to that discussion. So um, when we're thinking also about the least advantaged members of our society, we are often thinking um, in our highly racialized society, we have to think about race. And we have to think about how race comes into play and in thinking about medicine and health and mental health. Um, so race is a social and political construct. And I know that everyone has heard that term over and over and over again, especially race is a social construct. It is said over and over and over again. I have to tell you that I heard that many, many times, and it took a long time for me to really understand what it meant when somebody said that race is a social construct. And what it really means is that it does not have any sort of, a, of, of accurate biological or genetic basis in anything, um, that it is a, a, a system of classification that was created, that was constructed by society. Um, so constructed by people in our society to um, categorize people. Um, and in the construction of race, 
some people have kind of extrapolated that there are biological and genetic um, correlations or, ca or categorizations that these are um, somehow related, but in fact, it is specifically and completely only created within the context of society and does not have any sort of biological or genetic association. Um, I also think that sometimes when I say race is a social and a political construct designed to advance um, hierarchy of, of classes of people, of, of categorizations of people, then people start to say, oh, well then if it's, if it's socially constructed, then it, it can't, it's not that important um, because it doesn't like really exist. And that is also not particularly true because just because something is constructed by society, as many things in our society is constructed by society, um, doesn't mean that it doesn't have huge implications and massive salience when we talk about it. And one of the reasons why it has such huge implications is because, because it's a very rough and imprecise proxy for a number of other things. And some of those things include culture, sometimes those things could include genetics, and they also include things like socioeconomic status. Um, and so there are all these confounders that come into the ways that we socially classify race. Um, but in medicine in particular, it becomes complicated because we use race to confirm a number of uh, assumptions, prejudices, and biases that we hold about our patients. And then we apply those biases and assumptions and prejudices in the, in the act of delivering care and taking care of our, our patients. Okay, so here's a quote that I would like us to spend a little bit of time contemplating. Um, and it says, African Americans have higher incarceration rates, higher unemployment, lower incomes, lower home and business ownership, less education, less health care, more disease, and lower life expectancies than whites. If you believe Blacks are naturally dumb, sick, criminal, you have your answer for these discrepancies. If, however, you resist using stereotypes to make sense of your world, institutional racism provides a very practical, and very traceable explanation for the inferior societal position of African Americans. This particular quote, I think, is really important to spend a little bit of time thinking on, because I think um, on the surface, we can all agree, absolutely, um, we don't believe that Blacks are naturally dumb, sick, and criminal, and therefore we, we can all kind of get behind the idea that institutional racism is at work here. But I actually think kind of deeply in self-reflective practice, if we're, if we're to be honest with ourselves and kind of deeply think about these issues, I do believe that we all kind of harbor perhaps a belief that maybe there is some inequity around certain traits, skills, inherent um, differences between people of different racial groups. And I think uh, uh, we don't always spend enough time kind of interrogating the fact that we don't kind of naturally truly believe that racial groups are kind of completely and totally equal in every way. Uh, I don't think that we believe that. And I think because of the impacts of things like structural racism and, and the persistence of inequities, we have sometimes in a, inappropriately extrapolated and make, made assumptions about what's driving these differences. And we've made inaccurate assumptions about what are the drivers of these differences. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we proceed. Um, so we have to think a little bit about our history before we move on. So how did we get here? How do we get to this society that kind of extrapolates and makes the wrong assumptions when, we, when it comes to issues of race? Well, of course, we have to start with the founding of this country and, and our founding fathers gathering together to assert their independence from, um, from, from England. Um, and, and this, of course, is this famous painting, The Signers of the Declaration of Independence. And of course, we know this, this storied history of, of the United States that Thomas Jefferson and these founding fathers gathered together. Um, they created this declaration. Um, within this declaration are, are the powerful statement um, that comes that we are all familiar with. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which is just such a powerful missive and, and just um, a great thing to consider the foundation of a country, a, a great ideal to aspire to. And, and I think that the challenge that we again have to grapple with here is that when these men gather together into this room to create this document and to sign this document, um, 
when they said um, all men are created equal, they were not speaking of all of the people of the United States. Um, first and foremost, they were thinking about men. Um, and they were particularly thinking about the men that looked like the men in this uh, in this painting. Um, they were really talking about themselves being the ones that were endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And they were actually really specific to make sure that those unalienable rights were not really equally distributed in our society to women, to people of color, to any other groups that were not these particular men that looked like the men in this, in this um, picture. We fast forward about 50 years um, and um, the country uh, is now um, thinking and, and progressing and civilization is moving forward. And um, at that time, we see the rise of a physician by the name of Samuel Cartwright. Um, and Dr. Samuel Cartwright um, was not a psychiatrist, but he um, felt he had some expertise around psychiatry and particularly he felt he had particular expertise around the mental health workings of enslaved Black people. And so that was his area of focus and study. Um, and so um, in thinking about that, he defined two conditions that he noticed in enslaved Black people. The first was something he called drapetomania. And he said that this was the mental illness of enslaved Black people wanting to escape captivity, wanting to run away from their um, enslavement. And, and so in describing this particular mental illness, he said, if any one or more of them at any time are inclined to raise their heads to a level with their master or overseer, humanity and their own good requires that they should be punished until they fall into that submissive state which was intended for them to occupy. They have only to be kept in that state and treated like children to prevent and cure them from running away. And, um, the other condition he described was something called dysesthesia ethiopica. Um, he said that this was the mental illness of rascality or um, the, the tendency of um, enslaved black people to be lazy and not want to work hard. Um, and when he uh, described this particular condition, he said the disease is the natural, natural offspring of Negro liberty, the liberty to be idle, to wallow in filth and to indulge in improper food and drinks. After the prescribed course of treatment, the slave will look grateful and thankful to the white man whose compulsory power has restored his sensation and dispelled the mist that clouded his intellect. Um, and I, I just wanna make a couple of comments on this. First, he described the course of treatment and, and for both of these conditions, the course of treatment um, that Samuel Cartwright was describing was whipping. Um, and then also a couple of things about this particular um, way that we describe these conditions and think about uh, Dr. Cartwright and history, because um, I think that it's, it's very reasonable to make the argument that he was a bit of a quack. And I think even at the time that he was talking about these things, there were many, many physicians that did not really believe in the, in the uh, theories of Dr. Samuel Cartwright. Um, and yet still, even in his time when he was not considered to be an expert, um, these, these thought processes that he um, conceptualized as mental illnesses have been incredibly persistent through time, particularly this idea that Black people are naturally lazy and that they don't want to work hard. That has been a stereotype that has, has been persistent over time and also makes uh, very little sense in, in thinking about enslaved Black people and the fact that they often um, had levels of productivity that were kind of far beyond what was a normal human being's uh, potential for productivity. And that productivity and work was really at a pace um, in which uh, those uh, particular people were often malnourished, um, undernourished, um, poor health care. Um, so they were um, operating at these incredible levels of productivity kind of beyond um, what normal human beings are asked to do. And they were doing it in terrible conditions. And yet still, there was this perception that these people were lazy and did not want to work hard. Um, and so um, again, how, how these things get distorted and then how they become um, persistent and, and maintain the stereotype um, over time is, is something that I think we have to be mindful of in thinking about the history. And then let's jump a little bit forward just a couple of years later, and we get to this Dred Scott decision, which was um, a case that went all the way to the Supreme Court um, of um, a, a man, a black man who um, was uh, in a, a slave holding state 
and then moved um, with his uh, slave owner to a non-slave holding state. Um, and then uh, felt very uh, reasonably that he should no longer be enslaved um, if he is living in a state that does not permit slavery. Um, and, and so this case went all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court um, said, um, no, he is not entitled to freedom because he is in a state that uh, is, is a non-slave holding state. And I, I just wanna read some of the statements that came out of the Supreme Court at this time. They said um, in this decision, they said, we think that black people are not included and we're not intended to be included under the word citizens in the constitution. And then, and can therefore claim none of the rights and privileges which that instrument provides for and secures to citizens of the United States. On the contrary, they were at the time of America's founding considered as a subordinate and inferior class of beings who had been subjugated by the dominant race and whether emancipated or not, yet remained subject to their authority and had no rights or privileges but should as those who held the power and the government might choose to grant them. Um, and I, I point out here that at this point, Frederick, Frederick Douglass uh, made a comment on this ruling that the highest authority has spoken. The voice of the Supreme Court has gone out over the troubled waves of the national conscience. And I bring this up to one, talk about the history um, of how structural racism has developed and sustained in our, in our country, but also just to um, highlight that the Supreme Court has a very long history of getting rulings very, very wrong. Okay, so um, let's get to some definitions. And first we will start with this definition of health disparity. So it is defined by the World Health Organization as differences in health status among distinct segments of the population, including differences that occur by gender, race and ethnicity, education or income, disability, or where you live. And I want to um, contrast that with the definition of health inequities, which are disparities in health that are the result of systemic, avoidable, and unjust social and economic policies and practices that create barriers to opportunity. So um, in thinking about that quote by Dr. Greer that we talked about earlier, I think it's important for us to contrast these things because what you notice here in these two definitions is when we talk about health disparities, it says that there are differences in health, but it does not have any explanation for the cause of those differences. And when we talk about health inequities, they're very specifically saying that these are differences in health that are specifically the result of systemic avoidable and unjust social and economic policies and practices. Why this is so important is because um, we in our uh, country uh, have a strong history of the individual fallacy of, of putting um, the, the blame for problems on the individual or on that particular group. That if we don't explicitly state what the cause of these differences in health are, we tend to kind of assume and move our thinking into perhaps the reason for these differences are internal, um, maybe cultural, maybe biological. Perhaps there is a certain um, kind of lack of that particular group that, that the disparity is, is, um, is obvious in. Perhaps they don't value their care in the same way. Perhaps they, um, they just, um, maybe have different genes and maybe different um, environmental factors that are causing um, these differences. Instead of really looking for the very specific systemic avoidable and unjust social and economic policies and practices that really drive all of the differences in health, almost all, I would say 99.9% .9 of the differences in health that we see in society. Um, and again, if you believe that racial groups are fully and completely equal, um, if you're not looking for systemic avoidable and, sun, su, un, and unjust social and economic policies and practices, you're looking in the wrong direction and you're um, not going to be able to answer the question appropriately. So I mentioned that we're practicing self-reflection throughout this talk. And so my first self-reflection question for everyone is this one. When thinking about differences in mental health outcomes among different racial and ethnic population group, groups, are we thinking about mental health disparities or are we thinking about mental health inequities? Where does your mind particularly go when you attempt to explain why we have differences in racial and ethnic outcomes among uh, groups around mental health outcomes? So think a little bit about that. 
and moving on. Um, so uh, again, we need to talk about the social determinants of mental health because it's really kind of grounding all of these um, concepts and we'll talk about how it does that. Um, the first, uh, it's a, it's a three-part definition. I, I like really complex definitions for things, as you will see. Um, so the first part of the definition, and this comes from the World Health Organization, is that the social determinants of mental health are the societal, environmental, and economic conditions that impact and affect mental health outcomes across various populations. These conditions are shaped by the distribution of money, power, and resources at global, national, and local levels which are themselves influenced by policy choices. And the social determinants of health are prominently responsible for the health disparities and inequities that we see both within and among populations. Okay, so um, as Dr. Hankerson mentioned, I have edited uh, these two books with my um, wonderful colleagues. The first of these books uh, is The Social Determinants of Mental Health. And this book really set out to gather all of the available evidence of how social determinants impact mental health outcomes in society. Um, and in so doing this, and doing this work with uh, Michael Compton, um, it became very clear that there is kind of um, these, these drivers of health, these drivers of mental health that we have not spent enough time focusing on, mm -hmm. and a clear um, connection between how social determinants impact and create poor mental health outcomes. And that work then led me to thinking about um, the more underlying factors that create the context for the social determinants of mental health. And that is work that I did with Sarah Vincent on social injustice and mental health. And now I'm going to walk you through uh, my conceptualization of these concepts and how I put these two things together um, in thinking about these issues. So this is um, a conceptualization that uh, Dr. Compton and I um, put together. And, and it looks really complicated, but it's actually not as bad as it looks. If you start at the very top of the figure, you're talking about adverse mental health outcomes and um, mental health inequities. Each time you move down the figure, you're actually moving further upstream. Um, so each step upstream is kind of one, um, one, one step down on this figure. So the next um, one level upstream from these poor outcomes and these inequities are risk factors. And we define risk factors as something that precedes a condition and increases the likelihood that somebody will develop that condition or develop that disease. And so here you can see that these risk factors include things like reduced options and poor choices. I will note that poor choices are based, the choices that we make are based on the choices that we have. So if we have very limited choices and limited options, oftentimes those choices look very poor, even when they actually might be the most rational choice in that particular set of options. Um, but it also includes behavioral risk factors, physiologic stress responses and psychological stress. And so in, in um, mental health and substance use treatment, we spend a lot of time trying to identify risk factors and then intervening with that, that risk factor to prevent that negative mental health outcome. Um, but in thinking about the social determinants of mental health, I have come to understand that if you are intervening at the level of the risk factor, you are intervening too late because there is all of this context that was created prior to the development of the, the risk factor that drives the risk factor, all this context further upstream. And so therefore, um, we move down the figure to get to that context. And, and when we move down the figure, we get to these boxes in the center of this figure here, the social determinants of mental health. This is not an exhaustive list of all of the social determinants that exist, but it's a, a starting place to think about these things. Um, and we call the social determinants of health uh, many things. Um, Bruce Link and Joe Phelan call them the fundamental causes of disease. And Sir Michael Marmot and Sir Jeffrey Rose cause these, call these things the causes of the causes. And so you can see here with all of these social determinants of mental health, things like adverse early life experiences and exposure to violence and low education and unemployment and poverty and homelessness and food insecurity and transportation insecurity and adverse features of the built environment and neighborhood dis disorder and climate change, that all of these social determinants are creating the context by which the risk factor develops, which then leads to the poor mental health outcome and the mental health inequities. But again, in thinking about this, I have come to understand that if you are intervening at the level of the social determinant, you are still intervening too late. 
because there is context that has been created prior to the development, further upstream from the social determinants of mental health. And really what's there at that foundation, if you go as far upstream as you could possibly go, you're actually getting to the concept of social injustice. You're getting to unfair and unjust distribution of opportunity in our society. And the thing that is driving that social injustice are two fundamental ideas. The first is social norms or the general belief systems that we have about people in our society, who in our society is worthy of advantage and who in our society is less worthy. And based on those social norms about who we have in our minds about who is worthy and who is less worthy, we create laws, policies, all these public policies that reflect that value system. And so those public policies that reflect that value system then lead to an unfair and unjust distribution of opportunity, which then leads to all of these social determinants of mental health that you see, which then leads to the risk factor, which then leads to the poor mental health outcome and the mental health inequity. So let's walk through this figure with an example. And the example I'm gonna use is um, crack cocaine. So if we think about the drug, if we think about crack cocaine, um, I think we could reflect a little bit on our social norms about the type of people who use crack cocaine. And, and thanks to the media and 1980s, we have some really strong opinions about the social norms of people who use crack cocaine. And in fact, um, when thinking about uh, crack cocaine, um, we have very racialized and very gendered perspectives, um, social norms. So, so we think about black men um, and, and when we think about black men using crack cocaine, our social norms are that they're dangerous, that they're violent, that they're criminals. Um, and when we think about black women who use crack cocaine, um, we think of them as terrible mothers, as people who um, put the use of the drug over the well-being of their children. These are the social norms and the value systems that we have around people who use this drug. Um, and so those social norms led to a number of public policies um, that created an unfair and unjust distribution of opportunity in our, in our society. And probably the most important of those policies was the 1986 Anti-Drug Abuse Act. Um, that particular act created um, a 100 to 1 jail sentencing disparity between crack cocaine and powder cocaine. And so powder cocaine powder cocaine was more associated with white people using it and crack cocaine was more associated with black people using it. And even though these uh, drugs are the same uh, chemical compound, that 100 to one jail sentencing disparity said that people, um, if they're arrested with one gram of crack cocaine in, in their possession, will get the very same um, jail sentence as somebody who's arrested with 100 grams of powder cocaine in their possession. And, and there's a huge difference between crack and powder, uh, between 100 and one. Um, be, because one gram of crack cocaine is obviously somebody who is using that for their personal use. Whereas 100 grams of a, of a drug is obviously somebody that has an intention to sell or distribute that particular drug. And so the idea that the criminal offense, that the policy that the law would be that you would have the same jail sentence as if you were intending to distribute and sell a drug when you were using that drug for your personal use is, is pretty harsh. Um, of course, that unfair and unjust distribution of opportunity leads to a cascading effect of social determinants of mental health, because um, if you're just thinking about the fact that the jail sentencing disparity then put people in jail for a really long time um, for a substance use disorder, um, then when those um, people uh, were released, are, are eventually released from jail, um, it's very, very hard for them to get employment, to find gainful employment, because they often have to check this box that says they have a felony. Um, and then if you're not able to get employed, which is an important social determinant of mental health, um, that, that kind of uh, thrusts you into poverty, another social determinant of mental health. Um, and then if you um, are poor, um, that tracks entirely with food insecurity. If you don't have a job, it's very hard to sustain housing if you don't have any money. Um, and also it's very hard in our current um, healthcare system to 
um, have health care if you don't have a job. So all of those social determinants are activated by this particular policy. But even more than that, there are intergenerational effects that are activated because one social determinant of mental health is adverse childhood experiences. And one adverse childhood experience is having a parent that's incarcerated. And so you see that the, the, the impacts of this are so wide, uh, wide reaching and that all of those activated social determinants based on unfair and un, uh, unjust policies really lead to a host of possible mental uh, negative mental health um, impacts. Um, two more things I wanna say about this particular um, slide is the first is that you, you all can see here that it says, um, an 18 to one jail sentencing disparity, it does not say 100 to one. And the reason for that is because in 2010, um, after much lobbying and much push and much presentation of the data that there is no difference between these two drugs, um, the very best that uh, could be done was a reduction of the jail sentencing disparity. And that law was the law that passed, a reduction from 100 to one to 18 to one. There was, there was not um, the capabilities to eliminate the drug sentencing disparity. The only thing that could be done was this 18 to one um, difference. And that's the current law of the land. Despite the fact that this law comes up um, in Congress every year, um, and it often doesn't get out of commi committee, but um, there are still active attempts to try to reduce this and eliminate this jail sentencing disparity. And the last part I'll say is this quote by Ernest Drucker, who said that the fundamental clinical accountability to, to drug treatment pro professionals, to individual patients has been subordinated to the goals of the criminal justice system. And so um, really when we think about crack cocaine, we don't take a treatment approach. We don't take a substance use treatment approach, we take a criminal justice approach in thinking about these particular patients. And I really want to contrast that, again, our social norms with our social norms about people who use opioids. Because when we think about people who use opioids, we do not think of them as um, terrible people who um, should be put in jail, we think of uh, op the op opioid use epidemic as a public health crisis. And um, we're much more focused on substance use treatment and much less focused on criminal justice um, uh, in uh, interventions for these populations. So I wanna um, move on very quickly to a couple of important uh, key concepts. Um, I mentioned I have lots of definitions for you all. Um, here's a couple of important definitions. Um, the first is essentialism. This is a belief that there are distinct, unchanging and natural characteristics that define social groups and facilitate the, their categorization. This is a tendency that we have particularly in medicine to want to put people into discrete, uh, categories. And here is the thing that human beings actually do not categorize as well as we believe that they do. And so we cannot put human beings into boxes and categories, discrete racial categories, discrete ethnic categories, discrete gender categories, or, or discrete sexuality categories. Um, and yet we try over and over and over again, and we run up uh, against a lot of problems when we try, but this uh, essentialism belief often comes up a lot. Um, erasure of context is uh, when we fail to consider the socio-historical socio context when seeking to understand inequities. Clearly, when I talked about Dr. Cartwright, that's um, very obvious. Another really great example of this is the work of Jonathan Metzl in describing the protest psychosis and how schizophrenia um, has changed um, and how we uh, how we perceive the people um, that have had uh, schizophrenia over the years. Biological determinism is the false belief that racial groups are biologically and genetically different. Um, it's again, weird to me that in 2022, um, that we can talk about biological determinism and that there are significant numbers of people that believe this. Um, that, there, uh, that there was a study in 2016 um, with, with students in which medical students stated that they believe such things as black people have thicker skin than white people or black people um, have fewer nerve endings than white people. Um, and then cultural determinism is like biological determinism's cousin. It's the false belief that these differences that we see are primarily the result of cultural beliefs. Um, so that the reason why we see these differences in outcomes are because different cultures value things differently. Some cultures are better at, at thinking about their health, thinking about their mental health than other cultures. And, and that is, I think, just as dangerous um, as biological determinism. 
Um, so here's another self-reflection question. What are the theories of biological and cultural determinism that I was taught in my medical and psychiatric education and training? Um, one thing about that self-reflection question that I find very interesting is that it often takes a while to get started in thinking about it, but once you kind of open that, that floodgate, you'll discover that you were taught a lot of really incorrect and erroneous uh, biological and cultural deterministic theories. Okay, also I, I mentioned this connection between oppression and poor health, so it's important for us to understand that oppression. Um, oppression, um, here are five faces of oppression as described by Iris Marion Young. Um, exploitation is the unequal exchange of one group's labor and energies for another group's advantage and advancement. Um, we can think about this when we think about um, the system of slavery, but in modern times, we can think about it in how we um, treat migrant farm workers, how we treat uh, warehouse workers, and then just um, our human traffic, the human trafficking that occurs in our society. Um, cultural imperialism is establishing the ruling class culture as the norm and othering all those groups that are not part of the dominant culture. I always say that the, the most um, salient example of cultural imperialism that I see is that whenever I review a study, um, looking at differences as it relates to race and ethnicity, and there are odds ratios, and there's a reference group, that white people are always the reference group, no matter how many people are in the study, no matter how many people of color are in the study, even if they are the majority of people in the study, white people are always the reference group. Um, and that's just kind of a subtle example of how we kind of norm everything to one group and then kind of see all of those other groups as, as others. Powerlessness is oppressed groups lacking power or being blocked from routes to gaining power. I would actually say currently examples of voter suppression are, are the clearest ways that we see powerless operating as a form of oppression. Marginalization is expelling specific groups from meaningful participation in society. We've had historical examples of this over and over and over again, um, but mass incarceration and treatment of indigenous populations in this country, are, are, I think are some of the most clear examples of that. And then violence are threats um, and um, experiences of both physical and structural violence. Okay, I have another definition, um, and this is structural racism, and it is also a multi-part definition. So structural racism is a system in which public policies, institutional practices, cultural representations, and other norms work in various often reinforcing ways to perpetuate racial group inequity. This system ident identifies dimensions of our history and culture that are um, that have allowed privileges associated with whiteness and disadvantages associated with color to endure and adapt over time. It is not something that a few people or institutions choose to practice. Instead, it has been a feature of the social, economic, and political systems in which we all exist, and it does not require the action or the intentions of others. And what that means is that we could get rid of all of the interpersonal discrimination that exists in our society today, and we would still see racial and ethnic inequities um, in our society due to the persistence of structural racism, due to the way that it is baked into our society. Okay, so in the very brief time that I have left, I wanna give a couple of ex data examples of how you see so social injustice and structural racism showing up in psychiatry in particular. Um, this is how we see um, structural racism showing up as it relates to residential segregation and the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic. Um, and so this data here is demonstrating the excess risk of black residents living more than a mile from a potential vaccination site. And here are just a couple of counties in which we see, there are multiple counties throughout um, the United States in which black people have to go significantly farther um, to get to the first vaccination site than white people do. And that is a direct result of residential segregation. That is a direct result of redlining policies um, from the 1930s that have been incredibly persistent at keeping segregation at the level that it is today. And why it's so important to think about this as it relates to structural racism is because, again, we get into these um, arguments around cultural determinism. We say, oh, Black people don't want the COVID vaccine because they have vaccine hesitancy because culturally they don't trust, there's a lot of mistrust and they don't trust the vaccine. And we don't look as, as powerfully for 
other structural reasons why Black people might not be getting the vaccine. It's one thing to have cultural beliefs that prevent you from getting the vaccine, but it's another thing if you want the vaccine and you can't access it. Um, and we don't necessarily think about the challenges. And when thinking about solutions, we spend a lot of time saying, oh, let's educate Black people about why it's important to get the vaccine. We did not say, let's develop um, transportation systems and let's put vaccination sites in neighborhoods that are predominantly Black. Um, because that will increase uh, vaccine um, utilization. So examples of how we're not thinking structurally when we should be. This is data from SAMHSA that shows that in 2018, 69% of Black adults and 67% of Latinx adults with any mental illness received no treatment. Um, and that this data um, for serious mental illness, 42% of Black adults and 44% of Latinx adults with serious mental illness received no treatment. And for substance use disorders, it's pretty scary. 89% uh, of Latinx adults with substance use disorders and 88% um, of Black adults reported receiving no treatment whatsoever. And again, if we take um, an individualistic uh, or a culturally deterministic and biologically deterministic approach to why we see these differences in outcomes, we might say, oh, Black and Latinx people have lots of stigma about accessing mental health services. Maybe they lack insight. They don't realize that they have a problem. Um, maybe that they're not interested in getting care. Um, but when directly asked, cost was the most commonly cited reason why people did not receive care, why Black people and Latinx people did not receive care, and that they cited this twice as often as minimizing symptoms and nearly five times as often as stigma. So we're, we're seeking out um, explanations for things and going in directions trying to solve problems, but really we're not getting to the fundamental structural um, reasons for these problems. So in the very little time that I have left, I'm going to talk about where we need to go. And we're currently in the state of inequality um, in which we have unequal access to opportunities. And many people think that um, the approach that we need to take is one of equality. Equality really centers the idea of fairness. Equality is whatever we do for one population, we have to make sure we do exactly the same thing for the other population. We're evenly distributing the tools and assistance. And as you can see, equality does not get the job done. If you're focused on fairness, we're not gonna make progress. And so what we have to do is think about equity. We need to customize tools to identify and address the inequality. And we have to couple that, uh, that equity, those specific tools for those specific populations that need it the most, we have to couple that with justice which is when we fix the system to offer equal access to both tools and opportunities. So how we do that, um, a number of things. Um, the first is education and self-reflection. And so you he see here a number of books um, that are really exceptional on, this on these topics that really serve to supplement the lack of education that we've all had um, in these topics. Um, and, and this is kind of my page for people that aren't ready to read so much, um, or maybe they're just, you know, they're, they're just not interested. This is kind of the dip your toe kind of uh, uh, page where you can listen to podcasts, you can um, start some books that are much easier reads, you can watch um, documentaries about this. Um, so there's many ways to get started. And my last self-reflection question is how much time have I committed to learning additional information about these topics, especially considering that they're not traditionally thought, taught in education settings. Um, and so um, a couple, couple quick little comments before I end. Um, so one of the things that we can do to kind of get, uh, uh, move forward in this area is to practice cultural humility, which is when we commit to a lifelong process of self-evaluation, self-critique, when we desire to fix power imbalances between providers and clients, and we develop community partnerships. We need to couple cultural humility with structural competence, which is the trained ability to discern how a host of issues that are defined as symptoms and clinical problems or attitudes or diseases are influenced by the upstream social determinants of, of mental health. We have to couple that with an anti-racist mentality um, and approach to how we think about this. Um, I'm not going to read this because I don't have time, but I will um, uh, make sure that everybody has access to the um, slides. And then we have um, to approach public policies and social norms. So we have to promote social norms of inclusion, equity, and respect. And we do that by enforcing social norms of inclusion and equity, educating or legislating to change social norms, observing and challenging our own biases, and evaluating and breaking down unnecessary hierarchies. We couple that with advocating for equitable public policies, recognizing that all policies are health policies, 
moving beyond our hospitals and treatment centers, advocating for policies that address the social determinants of mental health, communicating with our elected officials and promoting equitable representation, and advocating by center centering the voices of people with the most lived experience on these issues. So I will end by saying three important concepts. One, that po uh, political stances and policy interventions are required. Um, and so to remain apolitical or neutral, I, I, as psychiatry kind of culturally has done for a long time, it is actually a political stance because you're tacitly accepting the, sti uh, the status quo. And so we have to become better at speaking up. Um, and so Audre Lorde said, uh, when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcomed, but when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it is better to speak. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Dr. Shim, thank you just for a masterful, masterful presentation uh, that was comprehensive, not only in its scope, uh, but in also in, in uh, encouraging us to reflect and, and really providing um, tangible things for, for us to do um, going forward. So just thank you for that. Um, so we have about four minutes <laughs> to just go over q and I do want to just say that I think that if we were in person, um, I would say to you that you brought the house down. There are just tremendous um, comments in the in the chat. Um, one question that I do see is, um, can you talk about um, the connection between uh, the site? psychiatry and I think mass incarceration, the relationship between that or the prison industrial complex. Yeah, I, I think um, that's that's a, a, a long, um, I could provide a very long answer to that question because it's a very complex topic, but I would just say that um, psychiatry is complicit in um, perpetuating the prison industrial complex and in kind of, um, Thinking about and and particular again, I could go on. I could go on for a very long time, but I would I would actually like challenge us to think about the ways that we consider personality disorders, um, antisocial personality disorder, how people interact with um, the criminal justice system or the carceral system, and how um, we've often used definitions and descriptions of diagnoses in ways that have not considered how uh, marginalized and minoritized populations um, interact very differently with the criminal justice system with mass incarceration. And so there's a, there's a lot to unpack around, um, around how we have um, marginalized um, whole populations in our society uh, around these issues. Um, but, but I do think that psychiatry has been um, part of that marginalization. <clears throat> Wonderful, thank you for that. Um... I, just to address, there are a lot of questions about, is this gonna be recorded and pe can people see it again? If yes, it is being recorded. If you would like to review this again, send an email to Kat Morris, kat.morris at mssm.edu and she will be able to send you the recording. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just having struggle finding any questions because there's so many just words of, of encouragement and, and gratitude. Uh, for your presentation. Do you have any other closing words? I mean, I know you gave us- Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I, talk, I talked, as I, as I tend to do, I talk longer than I expected to. So I apologize that there's not enough time for us to um, go through all of the, um, the, the discussion and, and the questions. I, I, you know, I, I really want us to think about, um, and, and probably I would say if there was a last self-reflection that I would ask us to walk away with, I would say um, self-reflect on what is, uh, you know, the problem seems incredibly massive. And I think that it's hard um, sometimes to think about like what the first step might be in trying to move forward. And I would use the self-reflection to spend some time thinking about what is one step that I could take in my personal life, in my practice, in the work that I do, what's one step that I can move towards around being anti-racist, around trying to address structural racism, around trying to eliminate social injustice in the ways um, that I practice in my clinical settings? What's one 
step that I might take. It could be um, devoting yourself to a practice of study. It could be increasing your knowledge on this. It could be um, looking at a policy in the clinic that you have and seeing if maybe that policy has um, implications um, in inequitable in, implications for people and trying to get that reform. But there is always kind of one thing that everyone can do. And so I would spend some time thinking about like, what's, what's a, the next one step that I could take. Amazing. Uh, well, thank you again. So I, I think it's critical that we all reflect on what's that one step that we can take as, as clinicians, researchers, administrators, whatever our role is, uh, to becoming more anti-racist uh, and really promoting social justice. Um, so thank you so much again, Dr. Shim, um, for just taking time for your busy schedule to be with us today. Um, thank you everyone for uh, coming to this uh, Psychiatry DEI and Institute for Health Equity Just Talk series. Um, and with that, we'll, we'll let you go. Have a wonderful day. Thank you again, Dr. Shim.